All right, so now we're recording. So um, welcome. Thank you all for spending a little time with us, um, both panelists and the um, participants, and they're continuing to trickle in. All right, so I thought we would just kind of keep this simple and um, start out by hearing a little bit from the panelists um, who I've asked to um, provide a little context for how they've used perusal um, to tell us about their course or the other context in which they've used it. Um, and a little bit about um, kind of what they did and stu what students learned. And so after we um, hear from the panelists for a couple minutes each, then we can just open it up to um, a conversation. Um, I know that a lot of the participants have used perusal um, as well. And so they might have um, ideas to share or we can talk about questions or places where people have um, run into trouble or wanted to fine tune their strategies. Um, with using this tool. And then Christy is here to help us out with any questions about Moodle integration or um, technological kinds of questions about the, the mechanisms of perusal um, and the settings and things. And we can all just kind of have a conversation and hopefully um, everybody comes away with either the desire to try perusal or some concrete ideas of how they might tweak or um, implement this tool in their courses. So that's the plan. Um, let's go ahead and um, start out hearing from panelists. So Sarah, do you want to kick us off and tell us a little bit about perusal and how you've used it? Sure. Um, and I'll offer a disclaimer. I am doing um, virtual school with three kids today. So if you hear things, that's what it is. Um, so those of you who don't know me well, um, I'm Sarah Eggy. I teach in history, um, primarily US history courses. And I used perusal this fall in block one. I taught a DLM course on citizenship. Um, and so I had all first years. Um, they were all in person every day and we were mostly outside. So just so you know the format. Um, and so I chose to use perusal because I knew we would be outside and we would not have access to all the technologies in a classroom. Uh, I also teach history, and so we use a lot of primary sources. And so I primarily use perusal to post primary sources that the students would read ahead of time and make comments. And then we would use those comments to have a discussion. So it was primarily a discussion-based course because we could use perusal and the students could read all of the sources ahead of time and then have a bit of a, a analysis together on perusal and then we would talk in class. So then my role really became a much more of a facilitator of discussion. I provided some more context sometimes. I would do little mini lectures where there were some uh, lack of clarity or they had questions, um, but that's really, so perusal really was, I think kind of an anchor in terms of the class structure itself, which I, I think is important to think about. It's not just an add-on, um, but it actually changed the way I could teach because it allowed me to teach outside in block one. Um, so I taught citizenship. And so a lot of the sources that the students read were court cases. Um, there were some laws and bills like um, immigration laws. Um, and then there were also some philosophy texts that they had to read because um, that's where a lot of the citizenship theory comes from. And so what's great is that these are dense texts. These are not easy to read, often they have to read them a couple times. And these are all first year students, so they don't, this is like their first go. So um, the assignment I gave them was for each source, they had to do this every day. Um, they had to at least post two times, but I said that was only the minimum and that they would get a C if they only posted twice. So most of them posted more than twice. But the first uh, one of them had to be uh, authentic original reaction. Um, they could say something that was interesting and why, um, or if they had just, they thought it was an important point, um, they could relate it over time. They could specifically do that more or they could relate it to other readings that they had done. Um, and then the other they, thing they had to post at least once was a question. So they had to have some sort of question about the text um, or they could ask a question of someone else. And so often they ended up responding to each other which was really important, I think. Um, and so they would post and then um, they had to post by 8 a.m. and we had class at 9.45. So I would frantically read all of their posts as they came in the day before. Um, and then the morning of, I would read them all. And then what helped me was that I knew the points that they were attracted to, what they wanted to talk about or the places where they had posted a bunch. And so then I could tailor my remarks and the discussion to those points of interest. And so uh, I thought that was really beneficial. 
I would add um, something that Robin's summer course emphasized was creating community and that the fact that they had to respond to each other that really fostered community. Um, so they got to know each other uh, through perusal kind of early on, especially when we were masked and distanced, it was difficult for them to get to know each other, but they could get to know each other. And I was pretty intentional about saying, so-and-so posted this and then you responded and trying to connect them in, in person. Um, I actually think that was really important because as the class unfolded, the students reported to me how um, lonely they were. And just, that was really important to get to, like there were other people and they had a group of friends through that experience. Um, Katie and I had, it was a DLM, so I had uh, 18 students, um, which is the, the limit for DLM. Um, and no, I did not put them in smaller groups. They all had to do it every time. Um, the other thing that I wanted to say off the bat is that it also helped, in addition to community, it also helped um, kind of teach students right away, sort of um, elevating their um, engagement in a college way, in a college level. So I had at least two students who, um, I'm trying to be nice. They thought they were smart, you know? Um, and so they would post things and then it, it just was not like this. And so what happened was the students were very kind and they would say, well, what do you mean? Or can you elaborate? And what helped them was to realize like they needed to, to do some of the work and they really needed to check themselves. Uh, in particular students who had come from, and I'm one of these students, I came from a very small town with a rural background and I just didn't know, I didn't have a lot of experience or exposure to a lot of things outside of my very small town. And so for those students who really um, maybe said some things out of that particular perspective, um, it was a good check and it was a very kind check um, for the students to really engage on perusal rather than having to do that face-to-face, -face, which can be kind of intimidating. So it really helped elevate students and bring them into the kind of college community um, in an important way. So I just wanted to add that. Um, and so just the last thing I'll say is that every day, again, we talked in class based on what they had written at perusal. Uh, I graded them. Um, and so I just used a five point scale. Um, and so they either, and then I had a rubric and so they could see where they were. And so basically what I told them is I don't want you to just regurgitate or just say, this is cool. Um, but they actually had to say something about the text or connect it to other texts um, or ask big questions. And so, um, as you might imagine, by giving them that feedback um, every day, their responses improved dramatically because they understood what they were supposed to be doing. Um, and I also note that it um, improved the writing because they were writing on perusal. Um, and you would think that these are small annotations, but they end up adding quite a bit. They also had to write daily journals. And so they had something they could build on for their daily journals as well. And then they had to write weekly papers. So all of those things fed together in this really nice way in, this, in a DLM course, which is a course on writing. And so I also think structurally, if you wanna use perusal you, and, and in terms of writing, you can connect it really well um, for a goal that's about um, writing well at a college level. Um, so I will pass it on to the next person. Thanks, Robin. Yeah, thanks, Sarah. I feel like you've, you've brought up a pretty wide range of themes of like the way things that Perusal did in your course. And so it'll be interesting to see how other folks touch on them. Um, I've been debating as Sarah talks about whether to go to the next historian, because we have two historians and two chemists, um, or whether to break up the disciplines. I think I'm going to go to a chemist, though, to um, keep those Division Three folks engaged. So um, let's see. Uh, Aaron, do you want to um, take it from here? And then we'll just kind of mix up disciplinary approaches. So I am Erin. I teach in chemistry. Um, I use perusal in both block one and two for the same course. So I taught general chemistry two. In block one, I had 15 students and in block two, I had 22. Um, and they were all annotating on the same documents um, as a big group. So I did a lot of the same things that Sarah did um, with less structure which is kind of nice to hear what Sarah did for the future. Um, so I flipped my class. So they had lecture videos that they watched that were not on perusal. I used Visia so that I could embed questions that students could answer without seeing other students answer. So I could see where they were at. Um, but then in perusal, we used an open source uh, textbook. So I downloaded the PDF and just uploaded it to perusal so that it remained free. Because if you don't do that, Perusal tries to charge you, which is really stupid. Um, so that's one downside to Perusal. You have to kind of work around the, the pay aspect of it. 
Um, but I would assign them certain page ranges each day and they had a reading assignment that was due. I had it due for block two at seven and we had class at nine. So to give myself a little bit of time, same thing that Sarah was doing um, to read through their comments and questions. And then that would allow me to prepare what I would talk to them about in the beginning of the class. Um, so that helped to facilitate the discussion early on in the class. Um, Something that I found, which probably would help if I was a little more structured in how I assigned perusal, but they didn't know, in block one, they didn't really know what they should have been doing. Um, so that took some coaching. And I think that having something concrete written out for them, like these are the expectations, this is what you should be doing, would have been beneficial. Um, in block two, I was a little bit more structured so that the responses were better. So students would ask really good questions or comments on things that they found interesting about the readings. And they'd also answer each other's questions. So in block two, I had less of me having to go answer these questions because students were answering them. So that was really nice um, way to engage all of the students, especially if there was a common question. Some of my um, A students would answer the questions that other people had, which was really awesome because then you could see kind of them interacting in a different way than what they're used to um, and having to actually explain something to a peer rather than me just answering all the questions. So I really like that about perusal because you could see all the different questions and comments. Um, I was pretty open with grading because some of my students expressed that they hate reading online. So the way that perusal grades in terms of their grade book is how much time you spend in the document itself um, so I, if they were the people that did not like reading online, they had a physical textbook, um, I would just tell them to make more comments. So there was hand waviness in terms of how I graded it, but um, as long as they were interacting in some way, I was happy with that because we had all, we had a lot of other ways that students were engaging. So my class lecture time was mostly group work. So they were still kind of working in groups, um, answering questions, problem solving, and um, the reading was more of a supplement to help them go through like the conceptual stuff um, as opposed to the problem solving. So it wasn't really, uh, this is kind of different from what Sarah's class was. Mine wasn't really the backbone type of, of my course. It was more of an extra thing that they could do to help them understand more of the concepts. So that's kind of how yeah. I, it was very similar to what Sarah did. Just Yeah, structure. yeah, but it's interesting to hear how it applied in a, in a kind of differently structured course. Um, so we're gonna go now to somebody who's neither a chemist nor a historian, Shauna. Um, so I will, um, so I use perusal in, um, religion 130 when I had 62 students that term. So it was a very, like a different context in that there was just a lot of students. Um, and it was, I was also teaching online. And when I came here, I, um, uh, I, 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 it was, it was new for me that students didn't read. I came from a school where students always read all the reading. And so I've been struggling since I came to center, I think with figuring out how to get students to do the assigned reading and engage with it actively. So some of my colleagues had recommended like these short reading quizzes. So I started that a couple um, years ago, much to my sort of chagrin, cause I'm not a big quiz person, <laughs> but I, I started doing these, these short reading quizzes that were um, often like, I would take the questions from the first two pages of the reading and almost universally, and I only do this in like an introduction to Asian religions or like a big, you know, class like that, 50% um, of the class would get a zero. And you're like, oh, you didn't even open the page and read the first page. Because if you'd read the title, you would have gotten 50% on the exam, right? Like, like just, so it was really disheartening to see how few students read. So uh, in comes perusal, um, I, I thought, oh, this sounds like a really good way and I don't want to give quizzes when I'm teaching online and I want to figure out, you know, another, I hate this quiz thing. And I mean, it does, it did mean that my grades were more varied, right? Because, and it was an actual real check when you give quizzes. 
So um, what I did was um, put up a bunch of text online. Again, like, like Sarah, we use a lot of primary source text um, in, in religious studies. So um, what I don't like about perusal, right, is, is that it's more reading online. It's more screen time um, when I would ideally like students to be reading a book <laughs> or on paper and getting a break. So that's one of the conflicts that I have with it. Um, as um, you know, Aaron said, the, the, I only used sources that I was using that I had in PDF form that were small enough that it was legal for me to put them up, right? As, um, so I, our textbook was not there, but that was fine because I didn't really want them to annotate a textbook. Um, but I will say this, I had more students prepared and reading for class than I've ever had. I did not have to quiz them. I actually set it up so I used Perusal's automatic grading system. Um, and I check, I had to check it because it wasn't always accurate, but it was a huge time saver on that front. Um, and students were really engaged. Now with the 60 you know, plus students, I could not um, read every comment um, before class. That was just not realistic, nor was it realistic for me to ever read every comment. So I spot checked. Um, but um, I had them do more than two. I had them do about seven, uh, seven a text usually. Um, there was um, engaging with primary sources. And I thought I might, for people who haven't seen Perusal, can I share my screen? You should be able to. Okay, let me just, um, all right. Um, sorry, let's see here. This should be, um, okay. So can you all see a Perusal screen? Yep. So here are all the things that I uploaded for the class. There were readings and there were um, also um, films. And that was one of the things that I liked. But so if um, this is the Upanishads reading, so it's primary source text, the way that I started was like, you'll see, it's like, here's a little comment from me, dear students, this is your first perusal assignment, right? There's a number of prompts throughout the document, please add your reflections. So if you click here, you can see these different things. So I, I had um, often put in little um, questions for them. So, um, you know, this is like my little kind of question and comment, which is like, here's, the, here's what this word means in Sanskrit. What are the kinds of connections that are being made throughout the text? You know, um, so I had them go through and then students are commenting. Um, and what I did, the reason that I had them do six or seven comments per time is that I wanted to make sure that they read through the whole text and didn't just, because um, sometimes it's 30 pages or 20 pages that they have to read. And so I wanted to make sure they were engaging, you know, more broadly. Um, but you can see here, you know, some, some did, some didn't, uh, you know, engage as, as well. This was the first assignment. Um, and then I'll just show you what a film looks like. Hold on one second. Um, uh, this one's kind of different. So this is a, 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 a kind of, uh, I wanted them to hear what it was like for the Heart Sutra to be chanted, which is a Buddhist text. Um, so this is what it looks like when they're commenting on a, a sort of, on a film. And um, so here's again, my like opening comment, right? And I was also able, which was pretty cool, throughout this film, there are different um, sites that are famous in Buddhism that like it doesn't tell you what they are. So I was able to then put in a, a, a comment telling you where this stupa was, which stupa it was, when it was built, things like that to contextualize it for them in the film. But again, just like putting them, putting comments throughout the film. So a lot of my work with perusal was ahead of time. Um, and I'll just stop sharing, but that gives you sort of an idea of what it looks like. Um, a lot of it was uh, ahead of time. And then I would ask students to bring their questions to class, right? The thing that I was uh, very weak on this term as far as um, being disciplined is that I had planned to be like, if you don't do the perusal assignment ahead of time, you will not get credit because this is the one thing I'm asking you to do before class. But because I was just like a sucker in COVID and felt like uh, students should just be able to do work whenever they could get it done, I basically ended up letting students do 
do the work until the end of the term for their perusal annotations. Um, and um, that means that like there were some students who actually weren't prepared for class when they should have been. But um, overall, I think it worked really well. Um, again, I just, my, my conflict is the sort of um, question about text and still wanting students to like read paper text and build a library, which is something I'm struggling with. I realized that you know, the, the bookstore just told me like, oh, these books that you've ordered, they're all, these are all the rental prices. And I was like, I don't want them to rent the books. I pick these books so that they buy them, right? And I want them to write in them. And so that's, I think, one of the struggles that I have with just like more digital media, but I am, um, I was pretty happy with perusal and feel like I'm going to definitely use it in more classes. Um, and we'll always use it in like, I think intro level classes it's particularly good in, because um, if they learn how to annotate, in an intro level class, I think they'll be able to annotate in upper level classes where we absolutely expect it, so. Yeah, that's cool. I'm, I'm glad you showed the video. That was kind of new to me that you could do that in perusal. And so um, I'm glad that we had a chance to see that. I'll also just share right now that um, the Eric Mazur, the one of the developers of perusal says that when he grades, he uses really big classes, uses it in really big classes and he encourages students to upvote and then he'll, he'll read the upvoted comments rather than kind of sorting through all of the comments, which like Shauna points out starts to get oppressive if your classes get bigger. Um, so let's move on to another chemist. Um, Jennifer, do you wanna share? Yeah. Um, the class that I used perusal with is a pretty different class than other folks who are teaching um, first years. I used it in physical organic chemistry. So it was junior and senior chem majors and chem minors. And the book that was our main text had been released as a PDF by the publisher during COVID. And so I emailed all the students and said, hey, dude, go download this book because th this is what we're going to use for class. And uh, I, I relate to Shauna's students because I always had a hard time reading the book. So I know that it's hard for, for science students to read um, even textbooks ahead of time because they're just not very proficient at reading technical material and they need practice and guidance. And so I do that. I have them read in a sophomore organic. And so, um, but this was second block and these were students who I had had before in other classes. And so I wasn't organized like Sarah and Aaron and Shauna and say, oh, you have to do this many things for this many points. And I just said, read it, talk about it, learn from each other. And, um, and if you don't tell them how many points it's gonna be and give them a deadline and expectations, they won't do it. And so what happened with my class is they, um, well, also, I, maybe I should point out a lot of time in class was supposed was group work, like what Aaron does. And I had six students and they all came to class and they didn't even, they had partners. They didn't even talk to their partners. So they didn't write in perusal. They, like there would be one or two. And so like, I would talk anyways, you have to have the times that it worked well is when we went through question formulation technique. And so then I would go and post those questions on, on the text and then they would respond to that. But if you don't give them any like something to hold on to, then um, they just behave like um, science majors usually do, which is they don't read the book. So I learned. So it sounds like it was a learning experience for you um, and maybe hopefully for the students as well in, in, in other ways. Well, I think the other problem is they would prefer to read it on paper and not um, online. And so then it's not as easy to do the annotation and whatever. Yeah, well, well, I think that that um, it's interesting to hear some of those same issues being echoed across disciplines too. that, like reading on paper or um, versus reading on the screen and the kind of the, the trade-offs there. All right, so our final uh, panelist is Sammy. Um, do you wanna uh, close out our slate of panelists and then we can open for broader conversation?
You're still muted. Is Sammy talking? I, I have it on speaker screen. Sorry. I, I That's like the first time I've done that. I've been so careful, just so careful. <laughs> no, I was just saying that um, I had like a bullet point of stuff that I just thought I'd bring up, but then uh, a lot of that I've been encouraged that a lot of you have had the same experiences. And so maybe there's a few things that I'll kind of just jump through in terms of differences. But uh, Sarah and I had spoken over the summer about how to use Perusal. And so I kind of mirrored some of what she did because uh, both of us, this was for a Middle East history class in the, during the first block. And most of these students, it was 300 level. There weren't any first years. So, you know, they kind of knew what to do in terms of an upper level course and things like that. And I had never used Perusal before. Typically I use like, um, with primary sources before class, because every class is a maybe 10 to 20 pages of a primary source that they would read. Um, and then we would start class with discussion of that primary source. Uh, and then I would do like a lecture or whatever I needed to feel like we needed to do to supplement it. But uh, in the past, I would always use the Moodle forums. And so I saw perusal as a uh, as uh, uh, an improvement from the Moodle forums, where normally I would have students, they would have to post in a Moodle forum uh, usually it's like two questions and then you have to respond to one colleague's question in a substantial way uh, with a direct reference from the text. And what excited me about perusal was I like the idea of having the students do something similar, but have the text with them. And so they're kind of annotating in the margin, so to speak. Um, like Shauna, I've kind of gone back and forth in terms of, you know, for me, if I'm having the students read a portion of the Quran or something about you know, from the 10th century, and it's this document that has been, it has been, we have received because people have carefully written it down generation after generation after generation. Um, and so in the past, I've had students where it's like they have to print out these PDFs and bring it to class. And I've given up, I've, you know, it's vast majority of them just want it on the computer, they want to bring their computers to class. And so I've, so I've liked the idea with perusal that they can do that. And it's there. And, um, and so for this time, what I did with perusal, was uh, I liked, I didn't, you know, at first I didn't do this, but um, I wanted it to be kind of a free for all, let students kind of interact with the text as they saw fit. Um, and, you know, you can, you can follow to see their engagement per page. That's one of the metrics that they have. And, you know, it always kind of looked like this. So as the, <laughs> as the, 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 the length of the document went on, the number of students engaging per page decreased. And so I made it to where when they started asking me about minimum requirements, uh, they had to engage with every page. Uh, and uh, uh, looking back, one of the things that I would have done differently would be even though they had to engage with every page, I wasn't necessarily giving them feedback after every day. And so they quickly learned, not quickly learned, but they quickly adapted and to, you know, they would have comments, maybe very substantial comments at the beginning. And then as the, the, the length of the document continued, they would write things like, well, this is cool or huh which in and of itself could be very pedagogically useful, uh, but wasn't what I was expecting. Uh, so one thing that I would like to kind of learn from you all is how to use the grading feature of perusal um, as a way of giving them that kind of instant feedback, even if I don't necessarily base their grades on it, right? Uh, but the other thing I really liked about perusal was I liked how fun it was for me to engage with the students on perusal. Uh, I never thought how many Simpson GIFs were applicable to early Islam, uh, just made it kind of really pop for the students. And I really enjoyed that. Uh, one of the challenges though, I think the students got into it a little too much to where, you know, even though the class was 25 students, I might have, um, uh, you know, I open the document in the, the morning of the class and there might be over 200 comments. And so then just trying to sift through those. And my students weren't very good about upvoting I kept trying to encourage them to upvote and I broke, I think part of the issue was I broke them into groups. And so maybe some of the groups of four or five students, it just wasn't enough. And I don't know, there just wasn't enough for them to upvote maybe uh, because that would have made it a lot easier for me to kind of pick out the, the main points or the topics or questions that I would have wanted to, to address. And so, um, but uh, let me see anything else I wanted to say. Oh, the other thing, and this is, I'm getting encouraged from this as well, because I was a bit of a sucker where students, I had them, they had to do all that work on perusal the midnight by midnight before the, the class. And uh, uh, very, you know, maybe two weeks into the block, students approached me and wanted to make it to where could they do it like 
before class. So simply that means in the morning they could wake up and be able to do the readings. And I thought, well, that would help if it takes down the pressure a little bit. Uh, but as a result, then you just didn't have as much students engaging with one another, right? They were just kind of, you know, dropping comments into the text and then leaving. Whereas I think if it was, if I had been firm and they had to have everything by the night before, that morning of, maybe there would have been, I could have had more time to comment and to, to do things like that. Um, and so I sort of regretted that as well, but I, I'll leave it at that. So. All right, well, thank you. Um, so Sammy kind of uh, introduced a, a potential question or topic, which is grading, um, but I wanna see if um, the participants have other questions or um, experiences that they wanna bring into the conversation. Um, can I jump in? Yes, please. So I used it. Um, I had my I had an upper level class of uh, behavioral neuroscience students, and I used it for case studies. Um, I had a book that was all case studies, and it was available on uh, perusal. And um, to make sure that the students were so, I had one group that would present the case, but I wanted the whole class to read the introduction to each case, so they would have the background information. And I put them in small groups of like four and five, just because I wanted to build a little bit of community, but that's not enough to get the automatic grading system to work. And then I also asked them to each post um, for if there was like five pages or 10 pages, or, well, there was rarely more than seven pages of text. Um, I asked them for 10 comments. So that was 200 and, cause I had 23 students, that was 230 comments. Yeah, every, you know, three per week, there's three cases per week. So whatever 230 times three is. So yeah, that was a lot to try to sift through and respond to. And I did for the first like week and then I gave up and I just, I just as long as they had the comments in there, I gave them the, the full points. So I would like to know more about the grading feature. Um, it was a bit of a learning curve for me too, because originally I told them to highlight words and define or explain them or something like that. And they thought that was tedious. So they just wanted to make comments. And so I said, as long as you make some sort of comment, but um, the longer the class went on, the less I uh, policed that. So I have no idea what they were saying by the end of the term. <laughs> as long as they were making comments, they got the, the credit, but they did seem to be prepared at least. They did seem to understand um, what the case was about uh, well enough to ask uh, good questions when the cases are presented. So yeah, that's my, my experience with it. Um, it was, I learned some things that I would do different. I'm interested in the larger groups. I'm interested in how that grading feature works. Yeah, so Shauna, you said you used the grading, the built-in grading feature, um, but you kind of spot checked it to make sure. Is that, do you have, how, how was it? Was it? I do. Um, I'm realizing I can't show the grade book, right? Because it violates for fun <laughs> because right. I can't figure out how to cut off my screen. But um, uh, it, um, so a couple of things, uh, a few times it, it misjudged. The problem with the upvoting that I, I, um, I found is that um, if students are ones to do it or like the first ones to write the comments, then they're not upvoting. So I was not comfortable grading them based on upvoting because my often my best, you know, most kind of disciplined students were the ones who wouldn't have time to upvote or read other people's comments as much. They were the ones who were starting the conversation um, and they might go back to it later, but that was something I didn't figure out. Um, maybe it would require them going back to the text multiple times. I hate having technology in my classrooms. I hate having computers in my classrooms. So I don't know what is gonna happen when I'm back in person actually, because I really don't want screen to like have them have screens in my classrooms. But like Sammy, I require text to be in front of them because we can't actually talk about like any of this stuff. And I'm, I'm really focused on close reading and, um, and um, want them to get at nuance. So it's, it's hard for me to uh, not have them have a text in front of them. Um, so I have not figured out what this is going to, if this means that like, then I am now succumbing to having technology in my classroom all the time. And that may, that may actually make me uh, retreat from this when I'm back in person. Um, what I would say is that with the grading feature, um, it automatically goes in a sort of three point grading uh, system, um, which I did not 
Like I, I didn't realize that I could actually change that. And you can actually have a lot more control over this. So I wish I had done a 10 point system, which would have mapped onto a hundred you know, points and a clear grade because I had to then convert everyone's grade from a three point, like 3.25 and, or, you know, or actually, sorry, no, 2.69 or whatever it was. And I had to convert that into a grade right at the end. And that was sort of laborious, um, trying to figure out the like minutia of those grades. Um, and it didn't have enough distinction. So I would make it a 10 point scale. And you can also be clear, like I want them to grade whether or not they're commenting on other students' comments. I want them to uh, grade about how many, you know, how many um, comments they make. I want, I want it to be graded based on how long they spend on the text, right? One of the things is that you can see how long a student spent on the text. So if I know like we're reading like a hardcore Buddhist philosophy text that is impossible to penetrate, and they spent 15 minutes on it, that's, that tells me a lot. Like there's no way, I, it takes me two hours to read it every single time and I've been reading it in the original for you know five years or whatever. So like, I, I just, there's some things that it, it tells you that I never knew about my students. So that was actually uh, illuminating, but um, I would be, I would say that it, it's worth it um, it's, it worked. I mean, again, I had a class of so many, I had so many students. So I broke them up into the small groups were 15 to 18 students. Um, so that was a really different, uh, small group than like three or four, but, um, I would say that it's worth it to take the time to set up the grade book before you start. Um, that's something I would take more time to do because I was sort of stuck. You're stuck with the grade book you have at the beginning. You can't go back and change it, um, midway. Um, but there was just no way, uh, like, like Katie, I, I had way too many, um, comments per class. So I, so by spot checking, what I would do is I would sort of look at what the, I would look at what the grades people got and I would look through, and I would also just try to read one comment from each student before class. Um, but even that honestly with 60 students, I did not read one comment per student per cl like class. This was like one of those things you know, I give a lot of comments on written work. This is one of those things where I like allowed this to be uh, mostly automatically graded. And it was like a gift to myself that I've never done before. So I actually really appreciated it. But that's all but, I have to say. Yeah, it's, it sounds like the um, grading system, which I haven't really looked that much at, is pretty robust in the sense that you can kind of select different um, variables that you want it to look at. Um, does anyone, uh, I see that Patton has a question in the comments, but I wanted to hear from anyone who kind of took a different approach to grading or didn't use the grade book or um, just kind of wants to share a different variant of how they graded, can, either panelists or speak, participants. Can I speak to the in-person versus online issue that was brought up? Sure. Um, so I actually, use, in block two, I use perusal um, and, I, and I used it in person, so I actually um, had a mostly in-person class, except for the students who were rotating through quarantine. Um, and um, one thing I've had an issue with uh, at Center has been having students have discussions, but pulling the, the text into that discussion in a robust way, um, if, it, if, it's an, if it's an academic conversation that's ongoing and not just have to sort of an opinion about holistically about the text to actually use the text as, as evidence. Um, and so I hit on something about halfway through block two. I, I, it actually allowed me to bring the text into the class as an actor itself by actually projecting the perusal onto the screen in class. And by doing that, I was able to go through in, into each individual student to ask them what the moments were that stuck out to them and then to look at that conversation specifically. And so there was sort of a prefab conversation that was already focused on a particular instance in the text. And then we could expand that conversation out from there. So I actually found it really useful to use in person because it, it brought the text in in a different way that I've been struggling with um, otherwise. Yeah, Jeff, I agree with that. I struggle sometimes when I want them to look at the specific wording or how the author is specifically doing something in the text and I want to build on that in discussion in the classroom. It ends up being a lot of, you know, students paging through something, trying to find the thing. And that's, it's just kind of, if I could start with the with the text and the conversation that had already been started there and then build already on that in the class, I think that that would, that would be really helpful. That sounds great. Can, um, can I add yes. to that real, just, sure. uh, I did something similar with my research students. I had them uh, in my research lab because we were not in person and couldn't be collecting EEGs. So I had them read the primary literature and then I did kind of what Jeffrey did was go through, I would bring it up and I'd go through and I'd say, 
Well, Lucas, you commented on this. What was your thought on that? And the one thing I found about it was that it really made them have to be on their toes because they couldn't just say, cool. You know, they had to, <laughs> when I'd ask them, well, what did you really think about that? You know, and they'd be like, uh, so, and the first two times I did it, it scared the bejesus out of them. But afterwards we had some good conversations. So like Lucas, you, you said, ha huh, here. Why, what was that? What was interesting or, or confounding about that? <laughs> and, then, and then it forces them to, to dig in. Yeah, I like that. Um, I also like that what I'm hearing where, where we're using the conversation that happens in perusal in the, in the class. I feel like one thing that I've heard about Moodle forums, for instance, is that it, you, it feels like it sort of can exist on one island and what happens in the class is a different island. And so, you know, bringing the two together and making what happens outside class matter for the conversation in class seems like it, it's an important thing to do. Um, yeah, we're picking on Lucas there. Um, so other thoughts about grading or strategies that worked or questions that you have? Sarah. I'll just say that I did not use the grading book because I was like, so my strategy for the fall was I need to, I'm here and I need to be here and I'm going to draw a straight line and make it as easy as possible. So I had my own rubric, which I can send to you, Robin, and you can send it out. Um, and I just graded them myself and then I just put the grades in Moodle, right? So they just had, I just used the Moodle grade book and I just put them in and so they could see their grades. And then in the Moodle grade book, I just wrote little comments like your annotation, I call it annotations, right? So instead of, but it's like your annotations were this and this and this and to improve do these things or work on this stuff um so i did not use it i i am going to have i have three courses in the spring and they're all full so i'm going to be shauna 2.0 um and so i'm that sounds wonderful if i can take a little bit of that off and have perusal do some of it i can still supplement but i won't be able to do the commenting like i could when i only had one class in each block um the other thing i was going to add and i think people have been talking about this but I think Sammy said something like, I like that I could interact with my students. So I did not use Simpson memes, but I, I really liked it because I could ask them questions and like kind of like Shauna did where I would have different person tests where I text where I had asked a question or I pointed out something. I think it does two things. It shows them that I am like just as curious about these things and also don't know things that I want to know about. Um, so that was kind of cool. It's a second, honey. And then um, the other thing that I really like is like, I can also model them. Like, again, sort of as first years you're writing, like, so I can provide a post that kind of showcases some of the skills um, or techniques that we're working on as we're developing our writing. So um, I think that's actually something that I've tried to do more and more as I teach is to be a little bit more vulnerable and authentic that I am a learner. Uh, I have you know, done this longer, but that doesn't mean that I still don't know things or have questions or still have to work through the process of engaging with primary sources. So um, I find that to be really helpful. And then in the classroom, we can talk about that. So the other final thing I'll say before I have to go help my daughter um, is that, um, uh, oh, I think I lost it. Oh no, I got it. So um, the going to the text thing, like, so that's huge. So I actually would like build the class into a couple different sections. So maybe we would be discussing something. And then I would say, okay, you know, five of you commented on this word in the text, let's look at it. And they would have their little, you know, and they would pull it up and like, we would actually get that moment to go back and really re-engage with it and ask that question again, like, why do we think that this is really important? Or what is it about this that like now that we've talked about it a little bit more, are there other things that we could bring into this discussion? So it really, I think, provides that holistic engagement that we might be promoting for our students. Okay, thanks. Thanks, Sarah. Um, so can I just yeah, chime sure. in on one thing? So there, so on the, um, oh, I just had it. Uh, well, that's one of, the, one of the other things that I was thinking about, oh, Sarah's talking about being vulnerable. So like some of these texts that I'm teaching are also very confusing and others are much clearer. So in the texts that are confusing, um, I think I also would be like, I've always found this creation story really strange or I told, you know, this, 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 you know, passage about, you know, this notion contradicts this other, you know, passage about the conception of the self and they're right next to each other. What I don't, you know, I don't know what to make of it. What do you, you know, so like I could do things like that that are quite genuine also. Um, I think that um, one of the things I struggle with, and I, I, I guess because it's a, a CTL session, this is a good one, is that we do know, of course, that reading on paper and annotating in pencil or pen, right, 
um, and taking notes that way students learn a lot more, right? And one of the things that I struggle with is that they, at the end of this, they don't have any record of this, right? Like, unless you make it downloadable and then they can't download necessarily the comments. I, I haven't figured out how they could, they, you know, cause they can't necessarily download with all the annotations. It means that they walk away from this class without any of the text and without any of some, you know, the, the best notes necessarily. And so this is something I'm struggling with because pedagogically we know this is not the best way to learn, um, but they are more engaged than they usually are. And they're doing more reading than they, when they're not doing it. So I don't, I, I guess I'm, I'm wondering what you all think about that and how to sort of balance that. Um, I, I mean, I do like the idea of projecting it on, uh, you know, I was, I was online completely. So we were, we all had our screens open. So, but I, um, I don't know. I just, I, I struggle with like what the evidence says about paper and pen and, you know, so. Yeah, no, totally. I hear you. Sammy, what are your thoughts on that? Yeah, so something I thought, because I'm going to be using perusal in January for this Arabic literature class that I'm teaching, and because uh, one of the things, I, and Shauna put it perfectly, and I didn't think of it this way, but one of the things I thought was missing was perusal was students coming back to perusal, and coming back to the document. Like it was just, there's, I was very pleased with a lot of the interaction, but then it just felt somewhat fleeting, and then we move on to the next document, and and so forth. So one thing that I'm, I, I thought, uh, what I've been doing is I put this class together, is my thought is the students will be interacting with, you know, Arabic poetry uh, on perusal, and then after that classroom, that class's discussion, they're going to have uh, study questions. They're going to have to go back and answer. And so what I'm hoping is between, and these questions are you know, aimed to kind of be their their personal notes on the, the you know, and I'll 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 be evaluating their notes and so forth. But the idea being that they they've worked through the text with a peer. They've worked through the text with me in class with alongside their peers. And then now here's these questions I want you to be able to answer about the text. And you'll have to go back to the notes that you took in perusal and the notes you've maybe took in class to answer these questions. Um, and that, that's kind of my strategy of trying to kind of get them to go, to go back to the text after processing it. And so whereas perusal isn't just for them to be like actively processing, but to come back and hopefully have kind of a, a consolidated uh, consolidated knowledge about the text. I would also add that um, from my, um, on take home exams and quizzes, I'll have a question where I'll say, uh, go back into Prusal or sometimes I use Google Docs, find a comment um, from that either you made or when your peers made and you know, I'd have some sort of a thing about how they expand on it. So, and I tell them I'm gonna do that ahead of time. Um, like I say, this is gonna be on the quiz or the exam. And so that, so that they're welcome to go back and pick that comment out ahead of time. And, and that's that's been really nice because then students, I frame it as getting to revisit conversations that, you know, we weren't able to pursue in class or something like that. It's worked pretty well. I did it in upper level classes, you know, where you have a little more um, students just sort of, you know, self-selected in terms of interest. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that sounds similar to um, something that I remember Johan talking about doing in his DLM where he would have kind of weekly um, response and summary um, essays where students had to not just talk about what they read and watched and looked at, but what others said in the conversation, like to kind of recount and, and synthesize the conversation that had happened that week. And that could be another place where you have students go back and, and pull out comments or, or conversations that were really thought provoking and, and to kind of weave them in. I mean, it doesn't really solve the problem that Shauna is highlighting, right? Which is that you don't end up with these paper PDFs that have your comments and underlines on them for you to go back to in the future. And I don't know, I mean, I don't know the limitate, like any possibility that might exist in perusal to export those. I, I'm not aware of that, but um, so it doesn't really solve that problem. Um, I guess the question is, does the social aspect and the engagement aspect kind of open a different door, even if it doesn't allow for that personal record of all of those, um, you know, PDFs. And make them downloadable. I just don't know. I don't think all the comments come with the right. downloadable. Like I, I but I, I haven't totally tried it. So that's right. a question. I just you think can't, they will. You can export them as, um, uh, Excel into Excel and stuff with the comments and everything, but 
it's just, it's ugly. Yeah, mm -hmm. it's not, I mean, I, I, I'm i totally with you, Shauna, and I was really, what you said about the idea of a library really resonates with me, you know, that like having this physical um, toolkit and then you open the book and it's not just that, I mean, you know, I can find the Aeneid online, right? <laughs> but it's the, it's what's in there and my notes and that history of those notes and 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 I, I hear you, but I just, I guess I'm with Sammy where I, I, I don't think I have the, um, uh, I just don't have it in me to make, to, to drill down on them with it. And so I, I, I gave in pretty quickly to like, fine, you have it on your computer, that's fine, so. Um, I wanted to bring up, uh, I saw in the chat, there's a little conversation happening about etiquette and um, kind of uh, students response. Um, although I also see Kristen has a comment about accessing the course after the class has ended, uh, maybe Christy can think about that. But I wanted to, to kind of uh, verbally go to the question about um, the nature of the conversations that develop. Um, it sounds like in some cases they're um, adding to the scholarly writing and thinking that students are doing in maybe more formally academic ways, but then there's also Simpsons GIFs um, in there so they can also be maybe um, more social, kind of less formal. Um, and then kind of a question about snarkiness or um, inappropriateness of comments. Um, and I saw a couple of responses to that in the chat about kind of general community guidelines for conversation, right? Which you might develop in your class being applied here. Any other thoughts or experiences about the, the kinds of comments and, and how besides modeling, you can get students toward respectful and kind of um, substantive commenting? I would just second what everyone has said in the chat that you have ground rules, you talk about them, you can model it, right? So you can put your own posts in or you can upvote your, the posts that are clear and or you can say it in class. Um, I had those couple students who needed a little help. And so the first time something happened, I immediately um, emailed them and I just said, you know, I really appreciate your contributions, um, but look like here's one of the issues or here's a, a helpful suggestion for how you need to rephrase it or here's the you know it's kind of you're straying in these particular ways I tried to be really because they're 18 right like I wanted to give them somewhat of the benefit of the doubt but also educate them like this is how we talk in college um so my I, just to say I think it's you just jump on it right away um at least in my opinion and and you just have a conversation with them and engage with them um just as you would in class, I think, if someone says something, you maybe after class talk to them or something. It, it, for me, it was felt the same. Um, and what I appreciate is um, the students that I worried the most about at the beginning um, made the most remarkable transformations and they were some of the most kind and you know smart, engaged students at the end because I think they felt like I, you know, we were all in this together and those first posts that maybe didn't quite do it, that they could recover and they could be part of the class. So, and especially, I think we have to think really carefully about student mental health and community and, and friendships that they're not being able to make. I think it was really important to give them that space to like build those and foster those relationships. So. Yeah, no, that's great. I actually had a similar experience as well. I had some I, one student in particular who was making some comments and I got um, an email from a student um, who was worried about um, some of the comments that were being made in perusal. And this, I don't know if this is the, this is the, the be all and end all of how, to, of how to approach this, but what I did is I went, in, I went into class and I actually did an anonymous pair deck and I had the students respond or, or sort of get out their reactions and their feelings to these comments. And then I read those comments to the entire class um, so that there was, it was sort of out in the open that there was, there were some comments that were, that people were, were considering inappropriate. And then we sort of systematically went through our ground rules after that and reiterated the ground rules. And that seemed to, to take care of things pretty well. And that one student did, just like Sarah was saying, did come around pretty well in the end to, uh, to being part of the community. So it worked out okay. Um, the other thing, just quickly, I, I went into perusal and I don't know if this is the best solution, but you can, for each assignment, you can download all of the, um, the responses for all, all the annotations that are made for each of the students. And you can download it in a spreadsheet. And then you could actually forward those to each of the students if you wanted to do that. So it would be sort of labor intensive, but you could get them their comments if you wanted to. Um, 
Yeah, I think I appreciate the the kinds of, uh, it sounds like in, in a lot of ways, it's not that different from the classroom, right? Students say things that are maybe not how we talk about things in college or that are offensive. And I think the difference is that you're there in the room and you can kind of respond in the moment, whereas in perusal, you're not always in the room. And I think it's actually a good thing that you're not always in the room because it lets some of those relationships, let students answer each other rather than you needing to answer everything and build up those relationships. But then there's the component where things can be happening there that you might not be aware of exactly um, and need to kind of go in and do what, what Jeff did or what Chana did to use them as opportunities to talk through what's going on, um, but maybe just not in the moment in the same way that is, you know, if, if you're in the classroom. Um, any insight on from Christy on um, ways to preserve? It would be nice, for instance, if, if students' perusal sign-in would still work after the class and they would have those, have access to that, but I don't know if that's true. It, I mean, I just, I was just testing as a student in one of, um, one of, sorry, words. Um, I was testing as one of Shauna's students um, from the block one course. So I logged in as that student um, and that student can still access. Um, <clears throat> so I don't know um, if you set, I mean, like if you try to go into one of the assignments that says the deadline has passed, but they can still access the material. So I don't know that there's any reason it would cut off. The only reason it would cut off, I believe, is if um, they no longer had access to the Moodle course. So after they graduate? Um, or once that Moodle course is put, pushed off onto the archives, which will happen this summer. <laughs> um, so Kristen? I think that they can actually, so Moodle creates a perusal account for them, because I think we had some like people who figured that out faculty wise this summer playing with perusal is that if you try to log in through the perusal app, you already had an account mm -hmm. through your center email because of Moodle. So if you clicked on it through Moodle first, it creates an account. So I think students just have to go into the perusal app and change their account, but they can access, because I, I asked, um, perusal a little bit about this. I tried to, to dive into this because I had students buy a textbook through perusal that they can use in another class that Jeff Feeberg teaches. So it's majors, upper levels, and they can use it in two classes. Um, and he's also planning to have them use perusal. So they should still be able to access. They basically told me that they have access to that book through the perusal app forever until perusal does not exist anymore. And I think that they can actually click on previous courses if they want to see their notes from specific, like the chapters that I taught they can go back into my course and see those as long as I don't delete that course from the perusal app, which I yes, think Moodle really getting archived doesn't delete it, I don't think, but I haven't tried that yet. <laughs> well, that's useful, even if they're not, I mean, they're not developing a paper library, at least they're not losing entirely what they, what they did in that context. Um, okay, so it's 11. Um, so I want to formally end so that um, I know you can get to your um, uh, Netflix binging or committee work or whatever it is that you have um, for the rest of the day. Um, but if anyone wants to stick around and talk more or pick Christy's brain about Moodle integration or anything like that, feel free to stay. But thanks to our panelists for sharing their experiences and also participants. Um, and I, I really look forward to using this in the spring with my DLM students. So thanks. Can I ask a question about the grade book? Yeah. So, um, so what? So if I'm looking at my grade book from just the last one. So they get a score, and it's based on all these things: distribution of annotations, content target. So you all are saying I can set that for certain parameters ahead of time, but I can't do it once the class starts and they start annotating. Then I have then it, whatever the grade book is is what it is, right? I, think. I don't know if you can change it in the middle, but I know that you can set it. I think you can set it per a different assignment. Like you can change it for a specific, like future assignments start doing this, but sure. and I think that's all it will do. So, okay, well, that's fine. If I, yeah. I am very open with telling my students, I screwed that up. I didn't know about, you know, this. And then I just fix it for the next assignment. So, um, okay, yeah. I. Cause I didn't know, I just was like, I can't deal with another grade book. I just figured out Moodle <laughs> grade book. <laughs> Been here a long time. Um, so I was like, okay, I'll just do that. Uh, just 
grade it in Moodle or put the grade in Moodle and, and yeah. But I now knowing that this exists and I can make it what I want it to be, that's awesome. Yeah, I'm just yeah. gonna put a plug about the integration with Moodle. So there several faculty had trouble actually getting it to integrate with the Moodle gradebook because the, I think the default grading scale in perusal is a three point grading scale. Yeah. And when that tries to translate to Moodle, Moodle always uses a hundred point grading scale. And so it does this weird, like if a student gets full credit, like three points, it's gonna give them a hundred, but if they get a two, it's gonna give them a 66, which means they're basically failing. And so my recommendation is either bump up the perusal try to make Moodle the same or just don't do the integration and put manual grades in Moodle. I think that's probably the easiest is just do manual grades in Moodle because it doesn't really translate very well. Um, so, I mean, I know it's a little bit more work, but it just doesn't, it doesn't seem to communicate well. So yes, it will do it, but not well. Okay. Yeah, I don't mind if I have the um, perusal grades I can quickly convert them over and just do the quick grading in Moodle. That doesn't take that long. Yeah. Can students see their perusal grades? Like, are they going to get confused when they see the two and then they think, oh crap, that's a 66, as opposed to what you might be thinking of, which is a B or something? A C? No, because no, a two doesn't in perusal doesn't mean a 66. It would only well, mean right. a, t a 66 in Moodle if it, if it was pulling right. in. But if the students, if, can they see in perusal that they got a two out of three? Uh, yes. Because I can imagine, you know, the worried student who's like, I think I got a 93.9, but you had a 93.7. Like that student might look at that two, two out of three and get freaked out. So um, I would just tell them it's cumulative and this is one assignment and you're going to have like 9,000. So chill. Yeah. <laughs> right. But it's what Katie Ann says, just telling them to ignore it, but, but having, knowing that they can see something and telling them in advance to ignore it is different from like, oh my gosh, professor, I don't understand why I have this, that, yeah. that sort of scared email that, that we all know. Um, I know when, it, when I did that perusal workshop with Mazur, um, people in my breakout room were saying they wish they could just turn gradebook off and they didn't use it much. Um, but so I, so I kind of think people do with it what they want. And it probably depends too on like, why you're having them do this, right? Is it to get a participation grade? Is it just to have better conversations in class? Is it a building block for some other activity that they're doing? Like how, how much do you care about really keeping tabs on those grades or do you just want them to do it? It's a, you know, binary zero one kind of situation or, or whatever it is, right? You probably need to think about that before you think about how you want to use the grade book. But I, I would think that if you don't give them any credit for it, then they're, they're not going to be as incentivized, incentivized right. to, you know, I mean, it's got to be worth something or they're going to be like, mm, why do I need to comment? I'm not going to get any points. Right. Well, mine, so mine were five points each, but it was total. Those annotations were 20% of my grade. So like they cared after they yeah. figured out that I was not messing around um, mm -hmm. with them. Um, the other question or the other thing I just wanted to say, so the videos are awesome um, that you can annotate within them and then the text, of course. So the other thing I couldn't get was podcasts. I have my students listen to quite a few podcasts and they, you can't, I could not figure out how to get a URL of a podcast in and they could listen to it and make comments in as you're like, as you're listening to it. So I ended up, which is, I just, I don't know if there is a way, that's my question, but I ended up um, getting transcripts of all the podcasts that I listened to. I just contacted the podcasters and said, I need transcripts. So they would listen to the podcast and then they had the transcript, the words in front of them, which I actually think was probably good anyway, because for accessibility, then they could mm -hmm. have it and they could read them. And then they just annotated the, the transcript. But I will say, I, I don't know, I, I just wondered if that was something that in your engagement with this if they've talked about podcasts at all. Katie Ann just said in the chat new new podcast. Yeah. So maybe they just I, added I it. have I have it open because I was poking around with stuff and there's um you know how it has the videos were new, but right below videos is something to add. It says podcasts. So oh. it now says that you can add podcasts and it just wants a URL. I mean so I do I, yeah. so they may have they may have added that just recently is what it looks like. 
Okay. I do think for accessibility, the idea of having a transcript and the idea of having videos with captions is probably yeah. a good idea, right? I mean, transcript is good for UDL anyway. Yeah. Right. And, and maybe for ADA re regulations as well. Mm -hmm. I just, I don't know. Sometimes for me, I'm, I want to have the transcription, but I think accessing the annotations then it could be nice to see them, you know, and then you can listen to that part again. Mm -hmm rather than you have it on the transcript and they have to go try right. to find the timing. And so I think it's, I think I would still have both, but I'd like to do the annotations on the thing and then have the transcript for that. So I don't know. Yeah. I'll play around with that. Cause I have URLs for the um, podcast that they listen to, but they wouldn't play. It wouldn't work. It didn't work. I think but it might be a new, like it might be a new yeah. feature. So that was, that was Pat this, you know, the end of the summer. So, okay. Oh, that's good from Kristen too, that you have to lock the closed captioning on the YouTube videos before you put it into perusal because you won't have the option to click it on once you're in there. Right. Yeah. yeah. All right. Those are my questions. Thank you. No, thanks, Sarah. Thanks so much. And yeah, let us know if the podcast thing works. I will. Yeah. Yeah. I plan to use a, a few for um, US history again, since there's a number of good ones. So. Cool. Okay. Thanks, everybody. Thank you. Can I ask a really basic question sure. while I still have you guys? I <laughs> do I have to sign up for my own account through the perusal uh, uh, website, or is there integration with Moodle? Like I was trying to find like what's going on. Um, I look, click through resources and activities and stuff, but I got you guys here, so maybe you can help me. Yeah, yeah it'll automatically create an account for you if you um, add the um, activity through Moodle. And yeah, and it's and it's under other tools, right? It's, yeah, um, external tools. So That's if you right. add an external tool and then use perusal, um, just type ah, in a title and then is. do the, yeah. Okay. And okay. Adding an external tool and then I. Select from the list perusal. You have to give it a name of the assignment. Uh, and I will say that um, you probably want a, mm, yeah, you can always change the assignment name, but it wants the, the assignment name to match the assignment that you create in perusal. Um, I see. So you want to probably go back and then copy the name that you create in perusal of the uh -huh. actual assignment back to the Moodle assignment name. I see. Okay. That makes sense. It does. Um, okay, this is good. So then I can access perusal from Moodle here? Yep. Okay. Right. Yep, and students, it just becomes a little link, um, and then it just goes directly to it, and everything is integrated. And yeah, that's, that's nice I'll, that they uh, don't have to sign into something separately, that they just yeah. go through Moodle, and then they're inside of it, because that's just fewer chances for them to get lost or get confused, so. And yeah. that's how I access it, too, or I, mm -hmm. like, I, okay, cool. Yep, yep. Thank you very yeah. much, y'all. I appreciate no it always. Thank you. Right. See ya. Okay, Bye. see ya.